the first stroke show in a long time that I went to. Like, I was just like pretty much like newly a mom, mm -hmm. and I leaked milk like all over my clothes. <laughs> It's like, amazing. I was like, I could do this. No, I can't. I need to go home. <laughs> well, because your boobs respond to like intense emotion, don't they? No, I think they respond to not being like having a baby next to them and oh. eating the stuff that you're like making. And um and vigorous movement. Yeah, and vigorous movement, you know, to do. I'm here in Santa Monica in California, and I'm gonna be meeting up with Regina Spector, who I first interviewed way back in 2003. Now she's got a new record out. It's her first one in four years. It's called Remember Us to Life. His destiny was just too big to spend, so he broke it into smaller bills and change. By the time he tried to buy Regina Spector's route to pop stardom and critical acclaim is an unlikely one. Born in Moscow, a classically trained pianist emigrated to the Bronx when she was just nine years old. She cut her teeth touring the five boroughs, falling in with New York's burgeoning anti-folk scene in the early 2000s. With three self-released albums and tours with The Strokes and The Kings of Leon under her belt, she dropped her breakthrough album, Begin to Hope. This record solidified her reputation as an inventive songwriter. Her tunes are constantly surprising, whimsical, but never wussy. Since then, she's performed at the White House, released a further three albums, plus her Grammy-nominated song, You've Got Time, is the long-standing theme to hit show Orange is the New Black. You know, it's been a little bit of time, but it's not like you haven't been busy. Yeah. You had a baby, which is pretty much the most major thing that can ever happen to anybody. Yes. <laughs> How was that experience in terms of your creativity and the knock-on effect of that? Anyone who um, makes art has this paranoia because you sort of have to be um, really absorbed in the art and have all this time and you have to sort of be introspective and kind of obsessive mm -hmm. and a workaholic. I was scared and Jack was scared too. Like, how are we gonna make art? And are we gonna have any ideas? And I had this incredible experience where I actually ended up doing more work and writing more and having more ideas and making more art. You know, if I had 30 minutes, I was really using that 30 minutes where in the, you know, years leading up to it, I, I'm very good at procrastinating, like incredible at it. I, I have a great time for it too, <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> I was able to sort of not take any of it for granted. I heard that sort of, I heard that from, from a friend of mine who had a baby before where she said, I just feel like somehow I became like a more targeted beam where I could just sort of all of myself that was sort of dissipating and kind of foggy just sort of could concentrate. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to concentrate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really amazing, you know. So at least, uh, you know, I will never ever tell anybody that it's easy or anything like that. I think there are ways to be in the world and something that kind of works one way for somebody could be like very, very difficult for someone else. Mm. But for me, the experience was that I was able to make a lot more art. How do you feel about this record now that you've had, I mean, how much time have you had to step away from it? The process itself is so long. So actually, after having finished producing everything, it's been a while, but then there was mixing and then there's mastering and yeah. then there's the artwork. So it just kind of keeps going. Mm -hmm. I kind of, when I look at it, I, you know, there's a part of me that's going, how are you real, you know? Because it was a very different way of working for me. And I really got to explore certain things that I've just been dreaming about, like... The string sections? Oh, yes. The, the, the strings, orchestras, the, the yeah. orchestra, yeah. especially the, yeah. Now all that's left is just for me to become a real mermaid and then all my childhood dreams have been fulfilled. <laughs> <Mine> like <too. laughs> How can we make that happen? I know. Come on, we can do it. Um, well, the strings are really beautiful and impressive on this record. It just adds. This as look. long as they're impressive, Kim. They're impressive. That's, that's what I'm working. With. <laughs> but also like really lush, yeah, you know. And when yeah. when I think back to like listening to something like Soviet Kitsch, where it was like super stripped back. Yeah, it's fun to get to really explore and really go deeper and deeper with every record. And in some ways, like 
this is more related to my childhood because I grew up on classical music. Like, that was my first passion. It feels like also with this album that you're sort of dealing with pretty big, hefty concepts. You know, if you try to analyze things or even group them together while you're making art, mm. you're just kind of paralyzed because you have to be getting it out and you can't sort of be figuring it out at the same time. But then when you look back on it, you're like, so I am at some of the most happiest moments of my life and I am writing some of the darkest and kind of like most sad sometimes music. And it's this interesting thing where I feel like we're on a constant, um, what's that thing that they do on TV to make sure that like, you know, nobody says fuck, like, real time. So it's like a delay, you know, they have oh, yeah. that, like, fuck. They, you know. they just have the delay. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like in some ways, like, when you live life and you make art, you're on this kind of delay where, like, these things happen. Like, I, because there were, there were a few years leading up to sort of when I was writing this when, like, there was, like, a lot of death and tragedy and my loved ones and I was like oh my god this is you know this is grief and grief is horrible yeah. and you never truly get through it you know you kind of just like live in this new way mm -hmm. where you're obviously able to experience these great heights of of happiness and joy and gratitude but you you have this like new sub basement to to yourself that like you can never really get rid of, like it's there. Yeah. Then you kind of are living in this very raw, sensitive way. You know, I kind of always had that sort of like tragedies looming around outlook. Mm -hmm. I was just ha having come from, you it's know, amazing. generations yeah. of like Stalin and World War II and everybody had all these horrible stories that I grew up like listening to this, just people being taken out and shot or buried in the roads alive or all this like stuff. I, I sort of didn't grow up in the like Coca-Cola, Mickey Mouse, yeah. like woohoo. Like, yeah, you're Disney not in the suburban like, happy land. I got to America, I was like, come on guys, like World War II just happened, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> um, when I first heard of your music, it was kind of via Gordon Raphael and mm -hmm. the Strokes and, you know, back in those early days. And at the time I was living in England and I was, you know, hearing all this, all this stuff is going on in New York. It's all amazing and exciting. What was it like for you to be in the middle of that and, you know, meeting Adam Green and the anti-folk scene and the Trachtenberg family slideshow players, who I also loved back oh, then. Yeah, yeah. What was, give me a snapshot of that time. Okay, well, I could tell you that um, I was probably the last person in New York City to find out about the stroke. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I'm just, I don't know, like, I was broke and living in my parents' apartment in the Bronx mm -hmm. and just sort of, like, you know, I was doing my version of touring, which was basically like all the boroughs and with my backpack, like every <laughs> other day. Like, I had certain Wide scale. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> certain month, like where I would be like, let's say, you know, like the month of March, I could have like 17 shows in New York. Yeah. You know, and I was just playing like Midtown at a strange comedy club <laughs> and then at the, you know, music entertain, you know. Yeah. And then I would meet different people through that. Like, I would go to sidewalk open mic, which is where I met Adam, and or I, I met the slideshow players in, in the Midtown Comedy Club. And so I feel like because I was so broke and so in the Bronx, yeah. which nobody at that time was in the Bronx, like I never met a single person on the Lower East Side when I was like, I'm from the Bronx, they'd be like, me too. Yeah. Not a single fucking no. person was from the Bronx. <laughs> so I think I just averaged my, you know, five hours on the subway per day. And I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't, I wasn't buying records. I wasn't, I was just, you know, so. In a bubble. That's in, so a, funny. in a bubble. So I think all that stuff kind of came later. Like mm. I went on tour with the Strokes and the Kings of Leon and I'd literally met the Strokes maybe a month before and listened to their music two months before, you yeah. know, and, and so everything, and I'd never even heard of the Kings of Leon. And it was just, <laughs> 
And the way I went opening for Kings of Leon in Europe was they were sort of like when the tour was ending actually here in L.A., they were like, you know, Regina, honey, what are you going to do now? And I was like, I'm going to go back to New York, get my temp job and try to pay off all this travel I'd put on my dad's credit card to, Whoa. Like, to like go on tour because I wasn't signed or yeah. anything. I didn't have a manager. So, so they were like, well, come to Europe with us. And that's sort of like my entire experience was never of a big scene. It was always just of individuals mm -hmm. who were cool or whose music I liked. Okay, show me your hands. Let me see how actually small they are. <laughs> then, I mean, they're okay. not that little. Let's see. Oh, they're yeah. pretty small. Oh, <laughs> I find it, I just thought it's such a funny detail that you like wanted to be this classical <laughs> pianist and then, but your little hands were like holding you back. Or is it's, that a fallacy? It's not, it's not the little, no, because I mean, there are so many incredible classical musicians with tiny hands, <laughs> tinier than mine. No, it's a, it's a really a state of being. It's kind of like, it's basically the classical music is the Olympics of mm. music. Yeah. And it's just like you can play, you can play tennis or you can, you know, run and you could be really a fast runner. But they're like almost like a whole other universe away to be on that Olympian sort of level. And that was the thing that was hard for me to accept because when you love something so much, and you want to be good at it. And I think that that's actually sometimes where some people run into like sort of suffering, where you just want yourself to be something that you're just not. Yeah. And you won't accept it. And so because you won't accept it, you can't actually discover what it is you are built for. Because had I been like forcing myself and trying to become this, you know, 10, like it wasn't natural to me to practice 10 hours a day. I could never force myself. I was like staring out a window. I wanted to read a book. I wanted to do something else. But that's what like, that's, that makes you built for songwriting then yeah. or something else, you know. I'm just so grateful to be making music yeah. because that's what I love doing. And, you know, most of the time I'm just, thank God I found something that, that makes me happy, you know. Mm -hmm.